Hello and welcome back. We're going on our first fishing trip of this season. I'm Raj Kletke. It's been a long winter for many fishermen and an especially long year for me due to my knee issues. I'm anxious to go fishing and streams within an easy drive for me are open. So let's plan a trip for late March to early April. The snow will be gone, streamside brush will be short, and if we choose the right stream, the fish will be getting increasingly active after a cold winter. Since this is our first trip this year, there are some stream basics that I want to introduce or review with you. So this video may be a little long and lecture-like, so it may not be for everyone. Sorry about that. But understanding some stream basics help with fly selection and fishing techniques. So if you're a pretty serious fly fisherman, join me as we go to the Midwest Driftless area and fish some limestone, spring creeks, and streams. The Midwest Driftless Area is roughly an oval area surrounding La Crosse, Wisconsin and involving parts of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and a little bit of Illinois. The first three states are of special interest to the fly fishermen. The Driftless Area refers to the lack of glacial drift, the material left behind by a glacier. This area wasn't covered by the most recent glacier. It was, however, deeply eroded mainly by the melting glacier waters, forming valleys in the soil and underlying sedimentary rock. It's a beautiful area of deep valleys and forested bluffs. Much of the area is rural with gravel roads leading to the many streams and the valleys. The DNR in all three states has been very active and access for fishermen is generally excellent. Understanding a little about the terms limestone and spring waters will help not only on this trip, but on future trips this year. My way of looking at these terms is adequately accurate for most fly fishermen, but may not be entirely complete. A useful classification for fishermen of most of the moving water we fish is by their dominant source of water. Spring waters get their water predominantly from ground water released through springs. What we call freestone waters get their water predominantly from surface runoff, in other words, rain and snow melt. Tail waters get their water predominantly from reservoirs above a dam. Note that I said predominant source, not only source. Most moving waters are actually technically mixed waters. Predominantly spring-fed waters commonly have a relatively low gradient and most importantly have a relatively constant flow and reasonable temperatures year-round. Many spring waters have conditions ideal for trout and aquatic organisms with prolific hatches common. Predominantly, freestone waters take their characteristics from the land through which they flow, so they may be high gradient as they come down mountains or low gradients, gradient as they flow through flatter land. Commonly, they have a greater diversity of water types and therefore greater diversity but less density of aquatic organisms, so the hatches may be sparser. They have more variable flows and temperature fluctuations than spring-fed waters, so the quality of the fishing may be more seasonably dependent. Many of the classical trout streams and rivers that we fish are predominantly freestone. Good trout fishing for a variable distance below a dam commonly occurs with a bottom feed dam, but top feed dams also exist. Many of these tailwaters are quite popular for fishermen year-round as they have very constant temperature water ideal for aquatic organisms including trout. At some dams, flows, however, may vary as electrical usage demands often mandates how much water is released. The aquatic organisms don't seem to toler do seem to tolerate these flow changes, but sometimes we, the fishermen, don't. So don't get caught waiting during increased water release. Always check release schedules and pay attention to any changes in water height if waiting these tailwaters. Limestone waters refer to creeks, streams, or rivers that receive a lot of their water that has been in prolonged contact with limestone or dolomite, both sedimentary rocks rich in calcium carbonate. Dolomite also has increased magnesium. These are mainly the skeletal remains of marine organisms from eons ago. At least theoretically, a freestone water could receive some water that has lots of surface contact with limestone or dolomite, but the vast majority of these waters will be spring waters 
that are receiving groundwater that has percolated through limestone or dolomite. The calcium carbonate buffers acid, so the streams are often a little alkaline. The calcium is great for insects and crustacea for their exoskeletons. Sandstone, another sedimentary rock, is made up predominantly of minerals, adds very little chemically of interest to the trout stream, but this does filter water that percolates through it, making the water clearer. The driftless area we'll be fishing commonly has a porous topsoil underlying limestone or dolomite, which can be easily seen in many places as you fish these streams, and sandstone. So these will be limestone spring waters as rainwater is easily absorbed by the soil and percolates through the limestone, dolomite, and sandstone before entering the streams as, spring, as springs. Snowmelt or heavy rainstorms may overwhelm the filtering capacity, so sometimes these streams will get runoff and become muddied briefly. Rarely this runoff during times of flooding has scoured these streams temporarily killing larvae, nymphs, and trout, but these streams do bounce back and usually are very fishable with excellent hatches. Many other factors affect the choice of flies techniques also, but temperature, which also affects the oxygen supply, and type of water are major factors and enough information for our first trip together. So now that we know where, when, and what general class of water we'll be fishing, let's see what's happening. How do you know what's likely to be happening? This is one of the areas I fish, so I know by experience what to expect. But if I was new to the area, I'd call a fly shop and ask other fishermen who have fished the area. I'd also look at hatch charts or just have some general ideas from many years of fishing similar waters. Quick word about hatch charts. For most popular fishing areas, you can find hatch charts online. They're pretty good at telling you what organisms are present and the order in which hatches are likely to happen. They give a rough idea of when the hatches are likely to take place and a very rough idea of how long the hatches will last. Remember, some hatches last over several months, while other hatches may last only a brief time within the time frame listed on the hatch chart. We do see a small brown to black stonefly crawling on snow streamside in early spring around some of the streams, but I've not seen trout taking them. I always carry some black caddis imitations that should work if needed. The water temperature may still be cool, but I know that midges will be hatching as they hatch pretty much year round. Since this is a spring-fed water all winter, it's been receiving water around 45 degrees, although this may be cooled by snowmelt runoff. Likely some blue-winged olives have been emerging all winter, and they may be quite prolific if the water temperatures get above 45 degrees for this early betis species. By mid to late April, we likely would be getting some early mayflies and caddis also, but we're a little early on this trip, so we'll discuss these later for a later trip. However, it's always good to carry some crustacea, leeches, and streamers for any fishing trip. So now let's look at our tying list. We'll definitely need mid midges and blue-winged olives. Tie up some size 20 beadhead zebra midges, size 18 to 20 pheasant tail nymphs, and some simple wraps. I always bring some small soft hackles along, which will usually work as emergers in this early season. Later in the season, you may need more specific emergers. If you need help in tying any of these or want to review more about midges and blue wing olives, which I would recommend before this trip, please review my series on simple flies and fly fishing hatches as related to midges and blue wing olives. Tie some of your favorite leeches and streamers also. My favorite sow bug scud pattern is the minke, which is also shown in the simple fly series. But what about during non-hatch times? The water temperature is likely to be cool, yet, as I said, and during non-hatch times, the fish may be sluggish and not interested in the surface. So I want a weighted searching nymph to get my flies down near the bottom. While my choice has varied over the years, lately I've gone to the Whitlock Red Squirrel Tail Nymph. 
The tie is straightforward, but I'll show some steps that I use. My main objective for this fly is to get the attached dropper fly down, so I tie this fly on a size 12 or 10 and heavily weight it with a bead head and non-lead wire. Note that I reverse wind the wire so that after pushing the end of the wire around the hook, forward winding the thread will help hold it in place. Sometimes I use a clump of pheasant tail fibers for the tail, but the classic is to use a clump of hair. Here I'm using hair from a rabbit mask. Use this and the end of a medium gold ribbing to fully fill in the step behind the wire. Note I keep the ribbing on the near side of the hook. Dub and wind the abdomen. I use the standard SLF dubbing sold for the red squirrel tail nymph, but I doubt that it is critical. And then, as those of you who have seen my tie flying videos know, I wind extra thread wraps first so that they unwind as I reverse wind the ribbing. With beadhead nymphs, I often tie in the hackle and wind it in at this point. This helps with lots of thread showing just behind the bead in the finished fly, but this doesn't really matter, so suit yourself. If you try my way, be sure to keep the wound hackle forward so that you can easily dub a darker thorax behind the hackle. Then bring the thread forward and whip finish behind the bead. Again, you can use the classic SLF dubbing or any dark spiky dubbing for the thorax. While I'm using this nymph for weight, it's amazing how commonly I catch fish on this fly also, even in streams without stoneflies, which is what I think this fly represents. I guess it just represents some living food to the trout. I like fishing a single fly best, especially during an active emergence with rising fish or when swinging a soft hackle wet fly. But on this very early season trip, the fish may be surface shy and maybe even a little sluggish near the bottom. I'll try fishing slowly and likely mainly use my zebra min midge either as a dropper one to two feet below an alcaracatus, my favorite indicator fly, or as a dropper off the squirrel tail nymph when I want it even deeper. If I think a blue wing olive emergence will be happening in the afternoon, either because the day before one did, or I'm finding lots of betas nymphs with very dark wing cases on the rocks I turn over, I'll use a size 18 to 20 pheasant tail nymph as a dropper starting a few hours before the anticipated emergence. I like to be using long tippets and straight casts when quartering upstream. I usually use reach casts as needed to control drag on cross stream or downstream casts, and oval casts when indicator nymph fishing as this cast minimizes tangles. Please see my series on fly, tying, on fly fishing hatches part three if you need help on the reach cast. Orvis has a nice video by Peter Kutzer on how to make a Belgium cast or oval cast that is far better than I could make, so look up online if you aren't familiar with oval casting. Then get to a field and practice these casts. We'll be ready for the trip. What? You can't come with me to the Midwest Limestone Spring Water? You already have your March trip planned? You're taking the family south to warm weather, but you'll get to fish some tailwaters. Well, you can pretty much plan on the same flies, rigs, and casts. Midges and blue-winged olives are likely to be the major hatches, but these fish have been seeing midges, blue-winged olives, and fishermen for months, and they may be picky. You, you'll probably want a wider selection of fly patterns than I'll need on my trip. My fish are just becoming active and aren't likely to be as picky as the tailwater fish will be. If you're going out west and fishing one of the freestone rivers before the runoff, you'll definitely want midges, but choosing what else may be difficult. The temperatures could be in the 30s to 50s, and you'll have more water types to fish than I will. You'll want some midges and blue-winged olives also, maybe the western March brown, which emerges earlier than the eastern March brown, which is a totally different species. You'll want some streamers, etc. It's so variable that it's best to call a fly shop and ask about water temperature and recommended flies. 
I'm Raj Kletke, and I'll see you soon, either to start planning our next trip or get a report on this trip if I actually find time to go, which is possible, but unfortunately I need cataract surgery on both eyes, so I may not be actually going on this trip. But even so, I sure enjoyed planning it. I hope you did too. See you soon.